Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, uh, The Digital Health for Specialists, a Game Changer, Transforming How We Share Care. My name is Cathy Rainbird. I'm one of the managers in the education and adoption team here at the Australian Digital Health Agency. Uh, and I'm really excited to be bringing you this webinar this evening in collaboration with many others um, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, really excited because this is the beginning of the journey for a lot of specialists and this is going to really highlight how beneficial um, using digital health tools can be. To start, of course, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past and present. I'm speaking to you this evening from Manang Pipilum country, which is part of the Nonga Nation, and we're joined by speakers and panellists from across many, many nations. So I'd like to acknowledge all of them and as well welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us this evening. In terms of the little housekeeping, uh, your microphone will be muted throughout the session. Uh, you can, of course, though, ask questions at any time by typing them into the question pane, which you'll find on the side little control panel at the GoToWebinar interface, which you can expand and collapse by clicking on that little orange icon that you can see on your screen. And hopefully our screens and sound will match tonight. Um, hopefully my internet connection will keep up and hopefully yours will as well. But if you do notice a lag, it could be my end or your end. And hopefully we don't have too much of a problem with that. So to start, of course, we'd like to uh, just run through the agenda for this evening. And first of all, we'll be introducing our fabulous panel members and I'll get them all to uh, share their cameras and, and give everyone a wave in a little while. Um, then I'll briefly give an overview of those digital health tools that we at the Digital Health Agency have been working to implement and working in collaboration with primary health networks and many others across the country. I'll give you an overview of some current statistics and then hand over to um, a colleague of mine, Ian Davies from the agency to give an insight into our special program of work around specialist connections and use. Then we are passing on to our guest, one of our guest speakers, Dr. Coleman, to share his insights and open up for our panel discussion, which I'll encourage you to post questions for as well. So without any uh, further mucking around, uh, I'd like to mention our presenters and panel members. So joining me this evening, we do have a couple of PHN team members who we're working, as I said, closely with primary health networks across the country to help with the connections and getting specialists engaged in this space. So joining me this evening, I'd like to say thanks for joining Simon Benj, who's a digital health team leader at the WA Primary Health Alliance, and whose work really uh, got this ball rolling for the presentation this evening. Also joining us, we have Pan Teng, who's the digital health lead from Sydney North PHN or Health Network. Thanks, Pan, and he helped to uh, find some of our specialists who are joining us this evening. Ian Davies, who's our program director for the Continuing Care Program, uh, as I mentioned, is also on the line and he'll be speaking in a moment. And I'll hand over to Pan now, who will introduce our special guests. Thanks, Pan. Great. Um, thanks, Cathy. It's my pleasure to introduce our two special guest speakers for tonight's webinar, Dr. Patrick Coleman from Northern Sydney PHN region and Dr. Anna Dawson from Central and Eastern Sydney PHN region. Um, Dr. Patrick Coleman is a nephrologist and general physician working on the northern beaches of Sydney. He graduated in medicine from University of uh, College in Cork, Ireland in 1991 and has worked in Cork, the Sunshine Coast, Dublin and Sydney. He is committed to the provision of comprehensive patient care and the promotion of optimizing patients' quality of life. He has also a keen interest in training and education, having held multiple related positions in Ireland and Australia. He currently resides on the Northern Beaches, where he enjoys spending as much time as possible with his two young children, partaking in a balanced, active outdoor lifestyle and the multiple benefits of living in a wonderful environment. Dr. Anna Dawson is a specialist pediatrician and allergist. She has a special interest in food allergy, anaphylaxis, and immunotherapy. 
She has been working for over 20 years in the St. George area after completing her training at Sydney Children's Hospital. She is a staff specialist at St. George Hospital and a VMO at Sydney Children's Hospital. Um, she's also a conjoint lecturer at the UNSW. Um, Anna is an examiner for medical students and also the national examiner for the Royal College of Physicians Pediatric Division. Um, Anna also has experience in adolescent medicine for the past nine years. She has supported the eating disorder unit at Sydney Children's Hospital as a consultant specialist. Um, she is a member of the Australasian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and a member of the Pediatric and Anaphylaxis Committees. Please welcome Patrick and Anna. Thank you very much, Pan. So very briefly, and I don't want to take up time because I want to get to our guest speakers, I think that's more important, but the Digital Health Agency has been working um, towards delivering our national digital health strategy, and that's involved a number of dig different digital health tools. My Health Record, which is the focus of this evening, being just one of those. I guess the thing that I like to highlight on this slide is that this work could only be possible by having these collaborate collaborations, as I mentioned with PHNs, but also with all states and territories, with state hospital jurisdictions, as well as clinical peak bodies um, and many others. Um, and I guess the other thing to highlight on this slide is that message under the pillar of my health record, that it's really about having health information available whenever and wherever it is needed. And that's essentially the beauty of my health record. And I'm sure Patrick is going to uh, share some insights around that space that'll, that'll hopefully convince you that it's a really worthwhile thing to get into. We have seen a huge explosion of the use of digital health tools, especially, uh, I guess, accelerated during the time of COVID. Uh, but uh, as I said, the focus for this evening will primarily be on my health record, but we do uh, work in some of these other areas as well. And if you do have questions about those, please feel free to pose them as well. In terms of some of the national statistics, these are actually from our website. You can find them on there, digitalhealth.gov.au. The important thing on this slide I like to point out is that most Australians, most people in Australia have a My Health record already. So it, most people who come to your practice, you'll be able to open their record and now find information. Initially, when My Health record was created, it started a bit like an empty folder and it's only as people interact with the system that the information builds up. But with COVID-19, immunisations, vaccinations, test results and so on, there's more and more information along with much, much more, which Patrick will go into. As I said, we've been working closely with a whole range of groups to get connection and use of the system. And the primary focus initially was on getting GPs and pharmacies connected, as well as public hospitals. And now specialists are, have been a real key focus for the agency. And there's been some real great, really great work done to progress uh, improvements in the software products that quite a few of you use to hopefully allow you to easily engage with the system. And Ian will talk about that more in a moment. So don't be disheartened by the fact that you've only got 22% registered. That's shifting dramatically um, and we're working towards making that reach the numbers that you can see for the other health sector groups on this screen. The other thing to point out on this slide that's really great to see is the amount of viewing in hospitals. And I think if you work in a hospital, find out how you can access it through your hospital system. Um, clinicians there are finding it invaluable to have that information readily to hand. And in terms of what's inside, as I said, the information is really starting to flow into the system. You can see on this slide, we've had over 608 million documents uploaded already into the system nationally, 246 million of those being clinical documents such as discharge summaries or pathology results. We also have medicines information and the consumer or individual patient themselves adding information as well. The other thing to point out here is that people who previously had opted out of my health record are perhaps now seeing seeing the light, I'd like to say, um, and opting back in. So uh, interesting to see that moving in that direction as well, which is fantastic. So Ian, I will now hand over to you for the Specialist Connections and Use Program update. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Cathy. Can I just double check you can hear me okay? To make sure we're... Yes, I can, thank you. 
Oh, all good. Thank you. Okay. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for your time uh, this evening. Um, I will be brief, um, so we can we can turn it over to our uh, clinical colleagues. But I just want to give you a bit of an update on the work that we're doing in the agency to support um, specialists getting connected to my health record system. Perhaps uh, most fundamentally, uh, we are working with the, soft, the, the, the vendors of practice management and clinical information software <clears throat> to ensure that their um, software is enhanced such that it can speak to my health record and upload and uh, uh, download from, from my health record. And if you, <clears throat> this has been a particular focus since about 2019, we kicked off this latest wave of activity. And as a result of that activity, as of now, you can see this a list of um, uh, vendors on, on the right hand side are ones who have already released their um, uh, uh, enhanced my health record um, functionality uh, as a re result of this latest push. Um, and on the left hand side there in the build and test, you can see the other um, products that are actually you know going through the process right now. They're they're in the software development um, stage or the testing uh, stage, and they we, they will come to market at, at different times over the coming months. I would like to see a few. That, uh, I would like to think a few of those um, will be coming to market uh, quite soon in the next uh, let's say two, three, four months, but it'll really be over the next uh, probably, I don't know, eight or nine months uh, that, that we would expect to see most of the, those guys um, go live. There are a few other products, uh, and, and an obvious one that springs to mind is Medical Director um, that, that already have my health record functionality released and in the market. Um, they're not on this list because they did that as of quite a few years ago. Um, but uh, but there are other products that not mentioned here um, that, that uh, are connected, but we've tried to capture the ones that are, I guess, most relevant and most uh, commonly used by, by specialists. Um, can we get to the next uh, slide? Thanks, um, Kathy. Uh, and, and then just to summarize at a very high level, when we talk about enhancing practice management software with uh, my health record functionality, what are we talking about? Well, very simply, Number one, it's about the uh, ability to view important information about your patients. The types of things which Kathy's already alluded to are things like hospital discharge summaries, pathology reports, shared health summaries, medicines, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, another big emphasis was um, we wanted to make it much easier uh, than it has been in the past for specialists to contribute to the My Health Record system. Um, and typically to do that uh, by um, uh, sending a copy of a specialist letter up to, up to My Health Record. Um, and we have worked very hard with the with the vendors to make that a kind of a sort of a, a passive thing that happens in the background that happens pretty automatically, um, uh, unless you go go out of your way to stop it because you don't wish it to go up or your patient doesn't wish it to go up or, or so forth. So we've gone out of our way to kind of make that as seamless as possible. And uh, along similar lines, uh, try to make it uh, easy for prescriptions to go up as well. Now, not every single product is 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 uploading prescriptions or uploading prescriptions yet. Um, it tends to vary a little bit by product in terms of exactly what they put up, what document types that they put up, um, but that was uh, that sort of a fairly common uh, piece of functionality um, uh, in amongst these things. Next slide, Kathy. And then the um, the uh, benefits of using my health record as reported by private specialists. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on this, and I think you might need to actually click forward a couple of times, Kathy, to uh, get the the rest of that slide. It looks like it has a bit of transition on it. Um, but in any case, the bullet points that you can see here, um, these were the results of, uh, of a survey we ran in about two th uh, 2020, so it's a little bit dated. Uh, but uh, we asked actually the early adopters that were using um, uh, the My Health Record functionality, what were the number one things that you that, that you found, or, or sorry, what were the, the, the biggest benefits that you saw? Um, it was these things, uh, according to the survey data, you know, saving data, time, requesting and gathering patient information, um, finding out information that you might not have had uh, in, in the past, not having to run duplicate pathology tests and so forth. Um, so that's the survey data. Um, perhaps more, more powerfully uh, for you, we'll be hearing uh, right from the people at the coalface themselves. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. Coleman, I'm sure, can kind of expand on his experience uh, and the actual benefits that he's seen in, in a you know, first-person way. The final thought I will leave you with um, is um, actually, sorry, can we go back uh, that, uh, for, for a second there, Kathy? Um, uh, a, a big part of what the agency is doing, in addition to helping um, uh, uh, software vendors enhance their products, is helping specialists and their practice managers register for, my, for the My Health Record System. So I think these details are repeated later in the in, in the pack, but uh, down at the bottom there in small print, you see the uh, the 1 300 number and the um, help email. If you do want help or your practice manager wants help, um, registering for this, uh, we've got people on deck that do nothing but this all, all day, every day, and we would love to hear from you and help you through the registration process. That's it for me, Kathy, and I'll, I'll hand it back.
Thank you so much, Ian, and uh, thank you for going back to highlight that support that uh, the Specialist Connections team can provide. So now, uh, with great pleasure, I'll hand over to you, Dr. Coleman, Patrick, uh, for your part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy, um, and welcome to everybody uh, to the webinar. Look, the first thing I wanted to say is that um, a lot of people who, who, who are working as specialists, their main concern is that uh, they think this is just all too difficult. Um, whereas in actual fact, you know, I'm in my mid fifties. I have no background in IT whatsoever. I do not, I do not touch type. I still just use these two little fingers. Um, I don't play computer games. I never have. Um, so really I am an IT dinosaur. Um, if I can use my health record, any idiot can use my health record. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, it's as easy as basically Genie is the is the most um, is the market leader, but all most of the software um, that is available for specialists have this functionality. And for Genie, um, if you could just press the next slide, please, uh, Kathy. Thank you very much. You just open the patient icon. Next slide, please. Kathy. You basically press the get IHA, IHI number. It takes almost no time. Then you press save. Kathy, thank you. And then you press the icon um, just at the top there. And bingo, you're into my health record. It is that simple, it is that quick, and it's it's just so easy. If you could press the next slide, please. Um, basically, at the top, just a moment ago, you saw there were various icons across the top. The second one from the left was Medicare, and just there. And basically, every medication dispensed to the patient is in front of you. And so if, like me, you have a lot of patients who are elderly or have poor health literacy or have forgotten to bring their medications with them as asked um, or really have no idea what medications they're on, you can see it right in front of you. It's just fantastic. It's so time-saving. The other thing that I would say is that when it comes to medications, if the medications haven't been dispensed, the patient isn't taking the medications. And so you can go into my health record, you can see what has been dispensed, and you know whether or not the patient has been taking their medications or not. So I find that very helpful. Scrolling down on exactly the same icon, you can see all the specialists and clinicians who've been involved in an individual patient's care. And you, same as me, will basically encounter a significant frustration on a regular basis when you're asking a patient who sees multiple other specialists what other specialists they're seeing, and they can't remember the names, they, they, they can't remember when they saw them, and so on. Well, basically, it's all there in front of you. Down the right hand side, this patient saw Patrick Coleman on the 29th of April, and you can go down for 10 or 15 years and see every specialist, every Medicare encounter that this patient has had. I find that very, very helpful and very, very um, time saving. Um, next slide, please. Across the top, you see the other icons that you can click on. You can click into pathology and access the patient's pathology imaging. Um, the one that uh, I use uh, not, um, not infrequently is others. I don't have a slide for this, but you can click on others. And for those specialists who automatically upload their correspondence into my health record, it's all there. So when I was doing ward rounds in the past at the hospital, 
and I'd be asked to see a patient um, because I'd seen them before or they've got chronic kidney disease and I'm being asked for, a, for a nephrology consult. I can't remember the details. In the past, I would ring my secretary and I would ask her to, to, to fax me a copy of the letter. I don't need to do that anymore. I can just go into my health record in the hospital, I can press on others, and I can download my own correspondence, my own letter with my own records, print it off, put it in the patient's notes, and I find that invaluable because you know it, it, it helps prompt my memory. And um, that's very, very helpful. Genie already has the capacity to automatically upload my letters into my health record. Um, I don't need to even think about it, it happens automatically. And that's, that's going to be possible for all the software um, vendors across the board, so that all specialist letters will ultimately have the potential to be in that others icon, um, which will be incredibly beneficial. I think where my health record will be particularly helpful in this kind of context is in emergency departments. I know that it's already um, being used a lot in emergency departments in Western Australia. It hasn't really caught on yet here because I don't think it, it's been promoted uh, sufficiently here yet. But even this, this weekend just gone, um, I was on call and I had discussions with people who were referring me patients and I was able to explain to them how to open my health record and they were able to access invaluable information for the patients that they were referring to me. Um, this is going to be hugely time-saving for people in emergency departments, um, particularly when you have elderly patients who come in with a delirium or cognitive impairment, who can't give a, a, a reasonable history, can't provide any information, it's all in my health record. And so I think this is really going to revolutionize the way that we can provide quality care to our patients. I think I'll leave it there. Um, really, I can't speak highly enough um, of my health record. I find it very time-saving. Um, and very, very helpful, both here in my private rooms, but also when I'm doing ward rounds at the hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. And I think you're a, a great advocate for our, uh, our um, My Health Record. I, I guess one thing to point out is that it doesn't replace your existing clinical records or you, the way you keep your notes but it supplements and complements that and gives you access to all of that information as Patrick just described. So I might open up now for our panel discussion, but before I do that, Patrick, maybe if you can come back on screen as well. I guess I was wondering um, in terms of that transforming of care and sharing of care, when you're seeing someone perhaps from interstate, um, have you got an example you'd like to share around that? Um, I live on the Northern Beaches, so a lot of people, um, come on holidays here from all over Australia. You know, I, I live right next to Manly. The hospital I work in is right next to Manly. Um, and, you know, people don't, don't carry their, their, their clinical records with them. And they frequently get sick while they're on holidays. So having this kind of information available is very helpful. But recently, um, I was seeing a, a patient who'd been who'd been living in Melbourne for the past two years. He has, a, he has a son and daughter, one of whom lives in Sydney, one of whom lives in Melbourne, and they've decided to share the care of their parents for two years at a time, two years in Sydney, two years in Melbourne. And he had just returned from his two-year stint in Melbourne. He's very elderly. He has multiple comorbidities. He sees innumerable specialists. Needless to say, I had no information whatsoever relating to the two years he had just spent in Melbourne. I was pretty frustrated. And then I thought, well, my health record, it was all there. 
I was able to access echoes, chest x-rays, blood test results. It was all there. It just, it just made the whole consultation possible. Where, whereas without my health record, it would have been an utter and total waste of time. His son had no information. The patient himself has mild cognitive impairment and, and, and poor English. And so without my health record, I would have been lost. So that was a really, really helpful encounter. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. I might ask our other panel members to turn their cameras back on and we'll open up to some questions. Um, Anna, if I could turn to you now. I know that uh, Patrick has actually been on board using my health record for some time, so much so that before Jeannie was fully conformant, he was cutting and pasting his letters and uploading them as an event summary, which I think is a, an astounding uh, feat. Um, uh, but Anna, I, I, I understand that you're much more recently coming on board to using my health record. What, what are your thoughts now that you're, or impressions now that you've just heard what uh, Patrick has said? Um, Patrick has given me more confidence in the use of my health record. Uh, my primary reason to get on board was that um, I was having a lot of time wasting trying to get information and um, even though the children may have been admitted under my care at the local hospital I wasn't getting the discharge summary I wasn't getting the results I wasn't getting the investigations which really hampered the optimization of the management of the child and if another specialist had been seeing them um, that information was not easily often found and I'd known about my health record for some time and I had my reservations because I thought it would be difficult to tee up. But eventually I thought, look, um, this will streamline the information sharing, the communication, because the staff were spending such a long time getting discharge summaries, getting the investigations. Um, it's been a little bit um, cumbersome to get on board because um, my practice has about eight different specialists and we're all just getting all of their um, uh, data under the same banner and you, you've got to get your um, certificates and certain NASH certificates which need to be incorporated into the Genie program. And thankfully I've got a new practice manager who's a bit savvy because I, um, I got it from the GP world and she's now coming to the specialist world which is kind of very optimising the timing of um, using her knowledge of previous um, use in the GP world to now um, helping me get on board. Um, so it's a little bit time consuming and I must say Jeannie was not as easy to incorporate all those certificates as I thought it was going to be but um, we hopefully will have everyone up and running and, and I've seen um, some of those um, uh, links that Patrick showed on the um, software package that we use. I've had a lot of help also from the primary healthcare network. So I'd advise any specialist out there to reach out and, and get that um, IT support, which has been invaluable. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. And on that note, that's a perfect segue to you, Simon. Uh, can you give us a little overview of what the primary health networks are able to do in terms of supporting specialists who do want to get connected and use the system? Sure, no problem at all. Um, so we work in a variety of different spaces and um, so speaking for myself, this is an area I've worked in for the last coming what, four years or so, um, uh, alongside yourself, Cathy, and others at the ADHA. So as part of the service that we can provide, um, we can speak with, uh, with each practice as an individual. Um, so to kind of work through and maybe identify some of those specific benefits and some of the workflows that really may support the work that they do. So it's not just a, here's a system, go out and use it. Um, we can certainly support that navigating your way through PRODA and health professional online services and all of the different bits and pieces that you need to have in place. Um, once you have them in place, fantastic, you're good to go. So just working your way through all those acronyms and all of those little bits and pieces, which can be um, a little bit confusing at times, that's what we're here to support with. Um, further on from there, we can obviously provide some training and we can provide support to all levels of the staff in terms of how it actually works within your system. And we're there really sort of ongoing from there onwards as well for any sort of trouble support, uh, troubleshooting support we can have. Um, having worked as a team in this space for a long time, there are no questions we have not heard before. So we're, 
quickly able to support everyone through that system there. Um, and then finally, just really the other thing is that there are obviously all the other digital health tools that are available. Um, so we can also kind of support with things like e-prescribing potentially or secure messaging and, and seeing how they fit in and really support my health record alongside um, everything else you do. Thanks, Simon. And I think one thing to point out is that uh, for those of you perhaps who are still to be convinced about my health record, although after tonight hopefully you are, um, getting registered and setting up your business or your private practice to connect to my health record will also make it much easier when you do want to then use e-prescribing as well. So going through those processes now is not just ticking off one box, but will help you in that space as well. Um, Ian, if I might call on you now just to briefly uh, reiterate what you mentioned in terms of support from the agency for specialist practices as well. Yeah, thanks very much, Cathy. I, I guess I'd just... Um... Uh, emphasize what, what a couple of people have alluded to, which is that there are uh, multiple players in the system that are very eager to help specialist practices, whether again, whether it's practice managers or the specialists themselves, um, kind of you know get over any hesitation for my health record and to get registered uh, for it. Um, I alluded to the um, to the ADHA contact numbers and contact uh, uh, email address, which again I think we'll put up at the end of this presentation again. Um, you can speak to someone uh, directly there. Uh, please don't think it's any sort of imposition. We've we, we've got people who are, um, you know, incentivized incentivized and 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 motivated to um, uh, get uh, specialist practices registered. It's what they do. It's 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 their expertise working through, um, you know, H Post and Prota and all those all those steps. Um, so so please do avail yourself of that. Equally, if you've got a relationship with your local PHN. Um, and, and, and they're in touch with you, by all means, uh, uh, make use of them. We are collaborating with the PHNs to give everyone just more options for coming in coming in the front door with my health record. And along the same lines, the, the, the list of vendors that I um, put up with, put, put up uh, earlier, um, the, the contractual arrangements we have in place with them uh, also provide a, a small financial incentive to the vendors themselves to actually support you and help you get through get get registered so the vendors have some skin in the game uh, at the moment that won't be a, that's not a permanent feature uh, it, it'll certainly be in place for you know the next you know this year and and um, um, and, and, and maybe sometime beyond but in, in in this period of time when we've got a special a special focus on the specialist sector, um, you know, we are ensuring that the vendors do have some skin in the game to um, actually um, incentivize them to, 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 to be helpful and proactive in, in helping you get registered. So between those sort of multiple cha uh, cha channels, um, you know, there's multiple options on the table for, for, for getting the help kind of where and when you need it. And I just certainly encourage you to avail yourself of it. Patrick, Kathy, going back to you. Comments? Yes, please. I was about to call on you next. <laughs> Excellent. Well, look, the assistance we got from our primary health network um, in recent years has been absolutely incredible. You know, really, really helpful. Nothing was too much trouble. Um, so definitely make use of them. They, they, they've been fantastic. Um, yeah. And I think the other comment you made to me, Patrick, was uh, about the effort it takes to do versus the... Uh, the benefit at the other end well yes but i guess um I, I didn't really take any effort on my part i just have the best practice manager in australia and so basically Don't tell. everyone will want it <laughs> <laughs> you know um she's she's basically been you know she she went through the whole process doggedly a few years ago i think the process has been streamlined since it has been made easier um, and would probably be be made progressively easier with the with the passage of time um but you know once once you're in it's it's really really helpful the only other thing i haven't mentioned yet is that it may also encourage um, specialists and other clinicians to improve their IT connection. You know, you you don't want to you don't want to be working with a slow IT connection. Um, so we've we've definitely um, gone out of our way to get as good a link as we possibly can. Nowadays, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the cost was significant. Nowadays, it makes it's it's peanuts. You know, you can just work really fast, a good connection. 
makes such a difference. And Patrick, the other thing that I think we were discussing earlier was how you now can uh, tell people who are trying to get hold of your letters that they can just find um, them through my health record. That uh, I'll say politely, yeah. Well, they basically we don't need to we don't need to fax my correspondence to them anymore. Um, we can just explain to them. Actually, it's in my health record, and it it kind of incentivizes them to 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 familiar familiarize themselves with getting copies of correspondence. So, at the hospital, for example, and the emergency department, we get you know two, three, four phone calls a day asking for copies of correspondence. Now all we have to do is explain, it's in my health record, just go to results, go to HealthyNet, it's all there and you can find it under other. And that's another convert. Every time that that happens, we don't need to send copies of the, of the correspondence anymore. There are, there are specialists out there, you know, I can't name names, but there are specialists out there who the minute that you, that, that I, that I hear that the patient I'm seeing for the first time has previously seen, been seen by that particular specialist, I want a copy of that specialist letter because I know just how detailed, I'm sure it's no different for Anna, you know, that some, some people write these incredibly detailed letters which are just the gold because you, you you at a glance you know everything about the patient it's fantastic hopefully at some stage in the future these letters will automatically get sucked up into the into the ether into into my health record and be available for people in emergency departments and 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 general practice and everywhere else well, funny you should say that, Patrick, because I've actually got a couple of screenshots which actually show the process in Genie, if I can get my slides to progress. Well, I don't think I can, just a moment. Um, so, as you mentioned, with Genie and other products, they all look slightly different and they're all integrating in a slightly different way and they also display differently. So, they won't all look the same with those tabs along the top that um, Patrick had in his slides earlier. Um, so, we do run sessions which show you how it works in different software as well, as well as in the hospital systems. It can all look slightly different. Um, so, check with your local hospital health informatics manager or your intranet um, and find out how you can access and view the information. And, and it might look slightly different, but the documents are underneath are there, the ones that we've been talking about tonight, all of the ones that um, Patrick's alluded to. But basically now in Genie, as you create your letter, you'll see that if you have connected and, and got all set up, there's this checkbox which says send a copy to my health record. And that's automatically checked. It can be unticked if you don't want the letter to be uploaded. Um, so you can make that choice, but by default it will go. So it will just as Patrick said, get magically sacked up and, and loaded up into my health record. Again, saving you time in terms of having to share that information with others um, and making sure it's available wherever that patient goes. Um, and once it's uh, created and finalised, when you click the, the save button after you've reviewed the letter or printed the letter, when you click save, that's when it is automatically, it will still get sent as per your usual process to whoever the referrer was, but it's then also available in my health record and as Patrick said, available for anybody else who's then pro providing care to that patient. I was, um, I was just double checking on my, uh, on my other screen that basically there's a default icon and so basically the default position in Genie, if you want to, is that every letter goes up. Every letter goes into my health record. You don't even have yep, to worry about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, and that's thanks to Ian's team and all the work they've been doing with the software vendors to get them integrated and able to do this. So uh, hats off to you as well, Ian. Really yeah, exciting to see this all happening. And I know that also the other thing that's happening is across some of the states, some hospitals are switching on the uploading of letters. Um, so not only discharge summaries going up from most hospitals now, um, and there is a list on our website where you can see which hospitals are connected, but most public hospitals are, private hospitals we're also working with, and again, pathology as well. It depends on the lab being connected, but most of them are as well, um, and so on. But um, 
yeah, in terms of having those letters uploaded, that's also now happening across some of the state um, jurisdiction hospitals. So I know, for instance, in Western Australia, they've started uploading specialist letters from their outpatient clinics. So that's also a really valuable source of information. So if you see someone from WA, Patrick, you'll know that there's lots of information in there. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I've seen a couple of questions coming in uh, from the audience. I haven't had a chance to look at those yet, but briefly earlier I saw there was one about the fact that patients can actually uh, remove information from their My Health record. Um, I might actually see, Pan, would you like to respond to that question? Sorry to put you on the spot. I haven't uh, given you the heads up about that question. Do you? Would you like to talk to that, Pan? Yep. I hope I'm saying the right thing, though. <laughs> um, um, so uh, I believe patients um, can actually put a record um, access uh, code. So this is about. Also, oh, this is rescinding information, or or so the the access you can actually lock access to the whole record if you want to, or you can lock it per per document on on a document basis. So you could say. I think the um, question. Sorry, Pan was actually about the um, removing of information. So taking a document down, for instance. Um, I, a, 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 a patient would not be able to do, to do that, as I understand it, because that's no, a clinician. No, they can. Sorry, Pan. I'm sorry maybe, about that. Maybe, maybe Simon, would you like to? Sure. Um, so yes, yeah, so that is something that patients can do. They've got every right to do it, I think. One of the general principles is that the My Health record is the patient's record, um, so they they are able to do it in the same way that they can ask you, as a clinician, not to upload something in the first place. Um, as we saw in Genie, there is that that option of not sending up to My Health record. Um, I think that's actually in many ways a real benefit because it's, it it adds a layer of comfort for people who may otherwise have chosen not to have a My Health record at all. So we may have individual documents that don't go up, which as clinicians, I'm sure you would love to have, but it may mean that you also do have things like pathology and scans and, and other information that you wouldn't have had otherwise if they'd chosen to, to opt out entirely. Um, and the, the, I think the, the real um, uh, experience that we find is actually very few people do that. I think once people are kind of quite happy with my health record, they're happy that clin their clinicians are viewing that record, there's uh, there's um, very few who do take the extra step, but of course, yes, they can if they would, if they choose to. Thanks, Simon. And I think I think the other thing to mention is that most patients actually probably come at it from the other angle if they're looking at their own my health record they tend to be probably more frustrated that some things are missing from their record. And I should point that out as well. It is dependent on the different organisations being connected and having uploaded those relevant documents. So they'll probably turn to you and say, well, why isn't my letter in there? Or why why is this lab report not in there or whatever? Um, so it, it, it's, it's I guess people are, are now seeing it as something that supports them being proactive in their healthcare. But yes, as Simon said, they can hide those documents. And as Pan said, they can put access codes over their records. Um, if they have put an access code on, I should point out though that in the emergency situation, um, there's training around when you can use it. There is an emergency break glass function to override those codes if needed. So if they have got those in place, but there is strict rules around those. So make sure you've uh, read up on that before you access in that manner and keep a track of why you've done it. Uh, in terms of uh, another question, uh, there's one here about do you have to upload letters to My Health Record if a patient requests this or is a patient unaware they have a My Health Record, do you still need to upload these documents? Patrick, can I throw that one to you? I have no idea but I, I think it's completely up to you. I mean if you, if you have written a particularly sensitive letter and you opt not to put it up in my health record you can just unclick the icon and it doesn't go up um, if a patient asks you it's never happened to me but uh, patients are perfectly within their rights to ask you not to upload a letter into my health record if that answers your question i was um just going to comment on that because 
um, you, if the patient asks, then I think it's, as you said, it's the patient's record. And we're using that to facilitate better communication. And if the patient doesn't want it uploaded, then you, you don't upload it. And that's, that's their request, I think. That's actually part of the legislation, um, Anna, so that's a really good point. It, it is actually, uh, if the patient requests that something not be uploaded, you need to comply with that request. But as I said, in general, I think most people understand that it's there to support their healthcare and to enable better shared care for them and that they actually want that information to be there, unless it is specifically very sensitive. And I guess if you were thinking of uploading a letter that did contain something very sensitive, you would also need to comply with local, state or territory um, rules and regulations around that, such as HIV status, where there's specific legislation, you still need to meet that, those legislative requirements. But Again, under the legislation, you as clinicians actually have the authority under the legislation to look at a person's My Health record and to upload unless they do specifically say, I don't want it uploaded. So you're covered by that. You don't have to actually seek consent or ask permission from the patient each time. Um, there's a question here for you, Ian. In terms of um, My Health Record, uh, linking into other programs and other work that's happening at the national level, um, there's one here which says, will the use of My Health Record eventually cancel out the need for programs such as QScript with the use of eScript? Can you respond to that one? I haven't heard of QScript. I'm not sure if that's a safe script program, but maybe that's from a different state. Yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with QScript, so I'll, I'll confess ignorance to to that one. Um, but in terms of um, my health record uh, superseding other things, um, the short answer is I don't think so. It's not the intention for my health record to supersede um, either electronic prescribing or secure messaging or the other tools that we that uh, are in common use um, these days. They all have their place and they all uh, uh, add value. Um, my health record is is um, another resource that we're building, and, and as Kathy alluded to before, it's um, it's it's not meant to be, and it never will be, the single source of a patient. All the all the um, information ever captured about a patient, uh, it, it does capture uh, what we hope is the most critical uh, 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 stuff um, about them, and that is the place that that you know that is the vision for my health record, and we are still working towards delivering that. You know, there are obviously still um, there's still, you know, a, a fair number of healthcare providers who have different stripes, including many specialists who are not yet on uh, my health record, uh, who are not yet contributing to, to 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 the record. So, a big focus for us in the coming years will be, uh, you know, filling those gaps as we have been doing progressively over the, over recent years, um, to kind of get closer to that my health record vision. But it's not about replacing stuff that's uh, that's in today. Another comment to make is, I guess, uh, that you alluded to earlier, Patrick, is that that little gold mine of information, once you are connected and able to see that information in terms of um, it, it just giving you access to so much more than you would otherwise have had. And I think that's where it's it's the real win. Um, so it might not all be there, it might not be a complete record, um, but if you can find out those nuggets of gold, um, that's really where the wins are, I think. Kathy, um, um, sorry, sorry, Patrick, you go. Sorry, oh, Patrick. No, go ahead, Punch. Oh, just a very quick thing around QScript. I believe that's the Queensland Safe Script um, real-time prescription monitoring program. So that's obviously an, an adjunct. I guess it's a it's a separate digital health initiative, and that's obviously trying to monitor uh, a harm minimization and life saving initiative uh, that all the jurisdictions have have stood up. And then there's a national data exchange exchange of data for all prescriptions and and dispensers along the um, um, that are sent electronically. So that is a separate digital health initiative, um, also very important, but not not really in the remit of my health record. Exactly, thank you, Pan. Um, so on that issue of safe script products, um, yeah, they would be completely separate to my health record because my health record is patient controlled and the individual can control that. We wouldn't want that to be the case for something like safe scripts or Q scripts. So it's a separate program of work. Patrick, back to you, sorry, cut you off there. I, I was just going to say that um, I, I work I work on the Northern Beaches. It's a, such a homogenous population. Um, but you know, there, there are pockets 
in most large cities in Australia that are extremely multicultural with a very um, broad range of, of health literacy and English language literacy, literacy. And when you're seeing you know, a patient who has poor English through no fault of their own and you're trying to, to put together their clinical history, um, it's, it's really challenging. And my health record kind of helps to fill that gap. And um, you know, in the in recent years with COVID-19, we had a situation in Sydney where there were hospitals in Western Sydney that were completely flooded. They were they were they were beyond capacity. And so we had very little COVID-19 on the northern beaches, and we were accepting patients from elsewhere into Northern Beaches Hospital. Many of the patients that we looked after on the COVID ward had little or no English. And they were coming from a different part of Sydney. We had no information on them whatsoever. We were able to log into my health record. It was fantastic. It was gold. It was really, really useful in that context. I think that's a really good point, Patrick, um, because um, when we have families that come to see us, um, they often assume that we have that knowledge, that somehow or other that information has just been sifted through to us. And um, and when they sit in front of us and, and I say, well, what happened? And who did you see? And, and then they look at us like, well, why don't you know these things? Because, you know, the, the doctors at the hospital said that the thing would come to you. And I see this as a uh, optimizing the vehicle of that information translation that we need um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, there are lots of areas throughout Australia where uh, people are you know, distance away from our specialists and and trying to get the the information that you need from something that happened a long distance away or uh, from someone who can't speak English. And so that's why it's quite important. Yeah, thanks, Anna. I was actually speaking to a uh, hospital pharmacist who worked, you know, who was working in a COVID-19 ward in ICU, and she was just, uh, yeah, saying uh, the same thing as you, Patrick, in terms of the real benefit of being able to access my health record for those patients, um, and be able to see, you know, their other conditions, their medications, whether they'd had a vaccine or not, which is included on in my health record through the Australian Immunisation Register, all of that information at their fingertips. The pharmacists love it. Um, Ian, there's another question here that I might throw to you, and we always get this question in these sorts of sessions, and it's around the security behind the system. Uh, would you like to give a bit of insight in terms of how the security behind my health record works and 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 what we have in place at the agency to ensure that security as well. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Um, thanks, Kathy. Um, I guess I'll, I'll I'll put a slightly personal perspective on this uh, because I've, I've I've been with the agency for a long time now. I've been uh, with them since before PCHR, which as the system used to be known, uh, was launched in 2012. And from the word go, understandably, you know, one of the big question marks, concerns around a system like this was around security. And it's been going since 2012. Um, and as you could completely expect, you know, th there's very strong, um, you know, technical security put around it. Um, I've heard the term military grade grade security before. I think we were told some somewhere along the line not to use that term. So forget I said it. Um, but you know, very very robust um, security around the around the system. Um, and you know, throughout the years, every year we report on um, any any issues that have arisen from it from a security security perspective. And it has been it has been a very very good track record. You know, in terms of in terms of security and and, and keeping that uh, that information. I'm safe. So there's both very, very strong technical protect protections um, against um, against uh, breaches. There's very, very strong legal protections around breaches and, and and consequences if if you know there's a rogue actor or you know rogue clinician, for example, who is doing the wrong thing with with the access that they were that they were granted to it. So it is a very robust system from 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 that perspective. Um, 
So, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I guess the reflection is that, you know, we are now, many people don't realize it's been going on that long. We are now approaching the 10 year anniversary and I have yet to read, uh, you know, a headline in the paper, you know, uh, expressing dismay about an, you know, a, you know, actual um, uh, security problem. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think that that uh, is a reflection of, of why. Thanks, Ian. And Anna, I think this uh, relates a bit to some of the frustration you're going through with your certificates and so on, because those certificates that are needed are, are part of ensuring the uh, security of the system and, and making sure that you can uh, uh, keep it secure and keep it safe. So that's uh, that's part of the reason you're going through this little bit of process at the moment that hopefully then will lead to this wonderful gold mine of information once you're through it. Yeah, Kathy, just persevere. It was frustrating, but um, just persevere, that's what I'm saying. And I think, Pat Patrick, you said previously, it's so worth it. Once you get there, it's so worth it. <laughs> and that's, I guess, totally. the key message for tonight. No <laughs> get question. Get connected and, and, <laughs> and start using. So I'll just um, throw up a couple of extra slides. I, I know we had a couple of extra questions in the uh, chat pane, but I, I'm conscious of the time. Um, we do have virtual classroom sessions running and demonstrations. We have sessions specifically for specialists. We have question and answer sessions, as well as demonstrations in specific software. You'll get a copy of these slides with the links, but you can also find them through our digital health website, which is uh, on the next slide. And that also includes uh, a link to the events and webinars page. In terms of supporting your practice managers, there's also um, some information about a session in here, which is around implementing the policies for your organisation and making sure everyone's appropriately trained and so on. So that can all help in that space. We also have e-learning modules that can support um, you. And there's a specific one around the privacy, security and access aspects. So if you have any concerns about that, I encourage you to complete that e-learning module. It's a really great module and covers off all of those key aspects. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have, and as Ian mentioned, we do have our connections and support team that can help and that website that's listed in the middle of this slide is um, a wealth of information as well as that uh, help connections team. If you email and say you want help getting registered, they will certainly get someone in contact with you very quickly. Um, but I guess I wanted to just round out the evening by throwing a final comment to you, Patrick. Um, what would be your key message to any other healthcare providers who are just starting out on this journey? Um, it doesn't matter if you're in your mid-50s or mid-60s and you're an IT Neanderthal, it doesn't matter. This is really, really easy to use. And to practice managers, I would say, yeah, the paperwork is cumbersome. You just have to persevere. You 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 will get through it. You know, it's like it's like when you when you applied for a mortgage for your house. You know, the paperwork is just endless. But but the house is worth it in the end. <laughs> I have to point out it's not paperwork anymore. It's all online now, Patrick, as well. So Anna's probably been doing it that way. <laughs> it used to be a paper form. That's how long ago Patrick in re registered. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, I, I'm just I'm, I'm just proving that I'm a complete dinosaur. <laughs> Anna, any final comments from you? Um, I'll just that it's going to be very worthwhile, and it will really help integrate your practice for your families and patients and um, and get your practice manager to really help. And your PHN <laughs> or the agency. Yes, On that note, thank you everyone for joining. I hope this webinar has inspired you and that you are now enthused and keen to get connected and not put off too much, um, but that you can see that it is worthwhile and that you will hit those nuggets of gold that are so worthwhile and will save you so much time in your practice uh, and help improve that sharing of care across the country. Um, so thank you very much to all of our guest speakers, especially to you, Patrick and Anna. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Simon, Pan and Ian as well. And I wish you all a very good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, Cathy. Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. Thank you.